ultimately, I think that what golfers are going to mostly experience is a slowing down of their ability to keep doing what they love as they get older. And so what we want to see is golfers and other athletes have the ability, whether it's recreational or professional, have the ability to keep doing what they want to do as long as they possibly can and extend the longevity of their passion. And so by having your younger cells available to you, you'll be able to tap into a better resource to get some of the treatments and therapies we need to continue to stay active as our bodies unfortunately start to slow down. Stay tuned to hear details about my best round ever and my six degrees of separation to this week's U.S. Open winner, Matt Fitzpatrick. This episode is brought to you by MyGolfingStore.com, home of the Eagle Eye Rangefinder with the exclusive price for golf smarter listeners like this one. Hi, this is Tom Sherman from Roxbury, New Jersey, and I play at Planters Valley Golf Course. This is Golf Smarter number 848. Become the best of your younger self with regenerative medicine with former Major League pitcher Dr. Drew Taylor. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Drew. Thank you so much, Fred. Excited to be here. Hey, thank you so much for coming on. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Uh, and we're going to talk about aging golfers and their bodies. Now, in doing some research on you, I just want to say golfers don't get older. We get smarter. Our bodies get older. Correct. <laughs> Absolutely true. But we still have to deal with that. Still have to deal with their bodies. It's why I love promoting things like stretching and yoga and, you know, trying to stay fit and trying to find the right exercises for a golfer's body. But we need to go beyond that, right? This is not what we're not talking about stretching today. Yeah, I think that there's definitely some basics that are, are table stakes for wanting to have a, a long career in playing golf, whether that's professionally or amateur or for fun, right? Um, which I would put my classification in. I, I'm definitely a golfer for fun. Um, so I think, you know, when we think about all of those things that you just described, those are the table stakes, right? But there are some things that we can do to really push the limits of, of how we can stay active later into our lives. And golfing is a phenomenal way to stay active. The best, probably, in my opinion. Really? Yeah. Well, if, if you're a walking golfer. Correct. Yeah, let, let's, let's yeah. push the golf cart aside. And what really frustrates me is I see, I think I see more people under 40 in golf carts than I do over 40. It drives me crazy. It's like, would you people get out of that golf cart and walk? That's why you're out here today. Oh, no, we're out here to drink beer. Oh, you'll pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, look, I mean, I think golf is is such a, a game that draws so many different types of people to it. I think you're always going to have that diversity of, of choices and how they, they engage with golf. But, uh, but certainly, I think putting the cart to the side, um, walking the course is the perfect way to enjoy it. Well, you're a much more tolerant human than I am. <laughs> Thank you. And that's why you have the PhD part of your name. So, but uh, even though you're a PhD, or in addition to the fact that you're Dr. Drew Taylor, you were also a professional athlete. I was, yeah. I uh, had the amazing opportunity to play uh, professional baseball. Tell me more. Yeah. Um, so I, I ended up um, going down to the University of Michigan for my undergrad in biology, and I ended up staying there and, and kind of fast-tracking through my, uh, my master's in molecular cell development biology and pitched for the Michigan Wolverines. Uh, served as their team captain in my last year, which was a real honor. Congratulations. Um, and uh, we ended up winning a Big Ten that year championship. So I wow. uh, had a great career um, at uh, at Michigan, and then was very lucky to have the opportunity to uh, to sign a contract and play for the Toronto Blue Jays. Wow! And yeah. it it you can't really tell from your accent, but very few people say go down to Michigan. <laughs> that's or <true>. Native Americans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that's true. That's probably my giveaway. I went down to Michigan. Yes. Exactly. Went, went south. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> I go yeah. up to Washington State. I go down to Los Angeles, but down to Michigan is a dead giveaway that you're from Canada. Correct. So the fact yeah. that you got to pitch for the Blue Jays, uh, yeah, it was home, hometown pretty team. awesome. Yeah, hometown team. I'm from Toronto, so that was a, a real honor and an amazing opportunity for me. Um, I uh, ended up um, playing in the minor leagues for the Blue Jays for uh, a handful of years, uh, three years, and then ended up uh, also having the opportunity to play for the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, went down to spring training with them in 2008. Didn't break camp with them. Um, I uh, ended up having an arm injury, which is part of my passion for trying to solve some of these issues that we have with soft tissues in our bodies. And um, and ultimately, that was, you know, kind of like the first signal that my career was probably not going to make that last jump into the to the big leagues. But I had a fantastic time. Um, played with some of of you know the best baseball players in in that time period, and and had an amazing experience. And was able to um, continue my education during it all, um, and that was that was what uh, what really led me to doing what I do today. When I had uh, the opportunity to play professional baseball, I had to give up going to medical school. So I literally started registering for classes and everything, not knowing you know whether I was going to go or not. And and ultimately, uh, I I couldn't do that at the same time; they wouldn't let me. But they did allow me to do a PhD while I was playing. And so I ended up registering at the University of Toronto uh, in biomedical engineering and did a PhD in regenerative medicine and stem cell biology. Wow. Uh, you must have not uh, had a lot of guys to talk to in the dugout. You know, we were pretty <laughs> lucky. Um, uh, I, you know, one of your sons went to Stanford. Um, one of my roommates went to Stanford. We had plenty to talk about. Brilliant, brilliant guy who is uh, a lawyer now uh, down in Austin, I believe. Um, and, you know, I think there was some some great guys in that group and some guys that had had gone to some fantastic schools and and had great educations and so we definitely had some things to talk about but baseball draws all sorts so yeah but not a lot of people who are trying to become doctors i was definitely the only one that was doing that level of work at the same time so i was the odd guy on the bus or the plane with a book open or my laptop open getting some work done um but i, I found some time to to have some fun too. Oh, good for you. Now, did you come from a lineage of doctors or athletes? Both. Huh? <laughs> uh, so um, my father, I am extremely lucky. My dad is an incredible human being, um, ended up uh, playing professional baseball with both the New York Mets and the Cleveland, or, sorry, Cleveland Indians, as well as the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, had a fantastic career, won a World Series with the Cardinals in 1964, and was also on the 1969 Miracle Mets. Bob Gibson's team. Bob Gibson's team, yeah. For yeah. St. Louis, so yes. I, I remember uh, being able to meet Bob Gibson a few times wow. in my life when I was younger and, and during reunions and such. He must have been So uh, it was a pretty uh, pretty fantastic uh, team in 64, and, and equally, if... Um, no, not even more notorious in, in 69 with the Miracle Mets, going from, from worst to first. Yeah. So I had yeah. a, a fantastic career. He was a closer, right-handed pitcher um, out of the bullpen. Wow, because uh, in those the Mets days, and, there weren't closers. Well, they didn't even classify them as saves or have the term closers, right? But ultimately, yeah. they went retrospectively and started to, to attribute saves, and he led the team in saves, right? So, you know... The closer was more by committee back in those days, um, but he certainly was uh, was a guy to come in and close the door. And did he also become a doctor? Or he did, he... yeah. So oh, uh, it's a really interesting story. We could talk. We could talk this whole time about my dad. He's an amazing okay. guy. But um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's talk baseball. Um, he volunteered for the USO programs after they won the World Series in 1969, and so um, he went over to Vietnam and mm -hmm. uh, toured through Vietnam. Um, most of the people volunteering for those programs were actors and dancers and singers. So you have kind of a show for the troops and things. Um, but baseball players, you know, they're not exactly able to, to join that. So ultimately they actually took the ball players and, and my dad and uh, Tug McGraw um, chummed around together there and they visited hospitals and actually spent time with some of the wounded soldiers sitting on the edges of beds and, and talking with them. Uh, my dad's undergrad before playing baseball was actually in electrical engineering, but that experience in Vietnam and meeting the, the wounded soldiers and troops uh, motivated him to want to pursue a career in medicine and to, to help people. 
Um, and so he ended up uh, retiring very shortly after that. I think he played for another season. Um, and then he was already at the, the end of his career. He could have probably held on for a little bit longer, but uh, he retired and he uh, applied to medical school um, and registered for courses. I think his first year in medical school, he was 36 years old and ended up um, having a, a, you know, getting accepted, getting his MD and having a career in, uh, in medicine afterwards. Were you pressured either in either direction? Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> no, I think like, I, I wouldn't say pressure. I was drawn to both, like right off the You're bat. My brother and I were very, very different people. So um, I kind of, as the older brother, jumped on baseball and, and, uh, and medicine. And so Matthew got to look, do Dad, what, look uh, what I'm doing. Yeah. So he went into film and marketing <laughs> and, and has had a fantastic career there. So, um, so yeah, I definitely was, was the one that was gravitated towards those, um, those avenues. All right. Well, we're going to talk about <laughs> why you're here, mm -hmm. <laughs> regenerative medicine, um, and your program ACORN, but we're going to wait and talk about that after the break. We'll be right back. This episode of the Golf Smarter Podcast is brought to you by MyGolfingStore.com, home of the Eagle Eye Rangefinder. Let's talk about the Eagle Eye Rangefinder. Actually, it's my favorite rangefinder, and it has all the premium features you need, like slope technology, an 800-yard range, and flagpole lock vibrating sensor. Yet, it's a fraction of the cost of all the overpriced rangefinders out there. And it's so easy to use. Just raise the rangefinder to your eye and find the pin. The eagle eye will automatically lock onto the target, even like me if you have shaky hands. And then it will vibrate when the laser has locked onto the pin. I have to tell you, this is my favorite feature because over the years I've used a lot of different rangefinders and I've always had the same problem with each of them. I couldn't get a clear reading because my hands were shaking while I was trying to focus on it. With my Eagle Eye rangefinder, I just click once and it locks on the target every time. Now, here's the best part. Usually the Eagle Eye rangefinder retails for $259.97. However, We've put together a special 50% off deal for Golf Smarter listeners. That means you can get the Eagle Eye Rangefinder right now for the ridiculously low price of only $129. Just go to mygolfingstore.com slash golf smarter. Again, that's mygolfingstore.com slash golf smarter. Or click on the link at golfsmarter.com. And I'll also put the link in today's show notes. However, I do need to warn you that this is a limited time deal and it won't last long. So go to mygolfingstore.com slash golf smarter and secure your range finder while you still can. All right, Drew, let's talk about the aging body, the golfer's aging body again. Mm -hmm. Golfers don't get older. We get smarter. Um, what kind of effects uh, for the normal person who their workout is playing a round of golf, uh, mm -hmm. what kind of effects does golf have on, on the aging body? Or is it the other way around? What kind of effects does aging have on a golfer's body? I, I think for, for a big part, it's actually the other way around, right? It's, it's what effects our bodies have as we age in wanting to engage with those activities that are healthy for us and good to do. Certainly there are repetitive injuries, chronic injuries that can come up from sports, including golf. Um, and it is a repetitive game, right? As far as, as swing patterns and, and all of those things. Um, that being said, as we get older, unfortunately, we just can't keep up with how we want to perform. Our cells are not performing to their best. Our body parts are not performing to their best. And we see a lot of common things with golfers. What we probably see a lot of is hip and knee injuries. Mm. Um, we definitely see elbow injuries, um, some shoulder. Um, so there's, there's a, it's really our joints start to fail us. And the biggest thing in joints is cartilage to, to fail. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately, my, 
my background when I was working at, at Mount Sinai Hospital here in Toronto um, was cartilage tissue engineering. The whole group in the endeavor was to recreate cartilage for people on demand as unfortunately our cartilage wears down and, and through wear and tear we lose that, that thickness. And so can we actually replace that for that individual? So it, it is, it is definitely a repeat injury where you're just, you know, over your lifetime, not just doing golf, but everything, right? We are constantly using our joints and that cartilage, um, unfortunately is not that great at repairing itself. Mm. So cartilage does not have any vascularization. There's no blood supply. There's no nervous inputs to it. It is a, on the, ends of our bones in our joints and it really acts as a cushion to protect uh, the bone and and to soften right any movement and as it gets thinner we start to feel it and it can be extremely painful and so ultimately if those tissues aren't receiving blood supply and all of these things it's it's we're reliant on things diffusing into that joint to repair those tissues and we're not very efficient at actually repairing cartilage and so it is probably the number one thing we think of in golf that we need to try to maintain health around and look for solutions so that we can replace that cartilage as we lose it because our bodies don't do that naturally well um and solutions Go go deeper with that when you say yeah. looking for a solution. So this was this was literally what I I spent the majority of of my education and and afterwards my career around was joining um, the biomedical skeletal tissues engineering team. So it is a, a group of people that have come together to try to solve um, the problem of wear and tear cartilage and, and osteoarthritis and the ability to recreate cartilage for a patient on demand. It's a fantastic group um, with a number of physicians and, and researchers that are working together to try to accomplish this. And I joined that group um, with my role being to translate some of the amazing work that had been done in animal studies and translate that into human models. So a pretty tall task, right? So I'm going to, yeah. um, it was exactly what I wanted to do. Obviously we talked earlier, I wanted to, to go and pursue the MD. I had the opportunity to do the PhD and I jumped on it. And um, it really was an opportunity for me to get on the clinical side of research. And so I was going into the OR with patients that were coming in for a total knee or a total hip arthroplasty. So basically a fake knee or a fake hip. And so they had reached a point where that damage had gotten to the level where it was impeding their life, right? And they weren't able to do the things that they wanted to do. And so now it's time to try to replace that. And what we do today is essentially shave off or cut off the ends of, of our bones, including the cartilage, and replace those with metal and plastic components to recreate that joint for us. Very successful surgery, right? A lot of probably listeners, because it is very common, have a fake knee or fake hip or have people that they know that have done it, and it can make a world of difference for that patient. Uh, the unfortunate part of it is it's not permanent, right? We are not, this is not our own body. Um, there's integration problems between the, the metal and our bone. They're not the same consistency. You get, you know, over time, uh, loosening of the joint and you will have to have it replaced, especially if you have this done earlier in your life. And so this is, you know, in a way a band aid. It's a very good one. Um, but, you're going to have to have another surgery. And the second time around, it's not nearly as successful. You have loss of bone stock. You have, you know, a host of complications that make it less successful, last for less time. And ultimately what we see is patients back in a state where they cannot ambulate or in a wheelchair eventually. And so we wanted to try to create permanent solutions, right? So if we can actually recreate your own body cartilage and replace it as you lose it, that could be a lifelong solution. So I was going into the R and OR for these patients coming in for surgery, taking biopsies of cells and bringing them back to the lab to see if in practice, we could grow out the functional tissues required as we had done in the animal models. To save you a lot of really boring reading, um, initially it Thank didn't you. work very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, and we dialed into all of these different reasons, including looking at the species differences between the animal models we were running in, in cow and sheep cells um, versus human cells. And it all boiled down to the age of the individual. All of the animal studies that had been completed were done on the equivalent of teenagers. So these are animals in the prime of their life, full of growth and development. And of course, when we tried to recreate these tissues, they performed extremely well and we were able to create full thickness cartilage. 
Sure. Right. Rich in the elements like collagen two and things that we need for healthy cartilage. And now in the human models, I'm going in on patients and taking biopsies at their time of need. They're already usually elderly. Uh, they now have complications like osteoarthritis or have loss of a full thickness cartilage. And now I'm taking those cells at their worst and asking them again to perform at their best. And it just mm -hmm. didn't work. And so we obviously in kind of zeroing in on this, got some old animal cells and some younger human cells and compared and, and the opposite happened. The older animal cells did not perform and the young human cells performed. And so we have a resource that is really what the next era of medicine, this idea of regenerative medicine, using our own bodies to heal ourselves, is the whole field is dependent on cells. We're not manufacturing chemical compounds in a laboratory where we're worried about purity for a drug. This is now leveraging your own body, your natural components to heal itself. And so the, the ability for us to do that, the limiting factor is the quality of the cells that we are going to have access to. And as we age, unfortunately, a lot of bad things happen to those cells, right? They fail us. They wear sure. down. They don't allow us to perform at our best. Every day that goes by, I don't care if you played 18 rounds the day before, did 100 push-ups that morning, you are a day older, right? Um it is something that is inevitable. And so what we have done is intercepted that aging process. And so what we created was an opportunity to take a sample of cells as the input for these regenerative medicine strategies earlier in your life so that we actually cryogenically freeze them down in liquid nitrogen where they do not age. They are frozen in time and act as a resource for you of your younger self with all of that regenerative ability as you age that you can draw upon. Wow. That's pretty remarkable. I, I, I need to go back because you said something earlier that I'm, I'm curious about. And is, it was about when you were talking about you discovered that it was these were, you know, younger cells. These were the equivalent of teenage cells. Mm -hmm. Was that like a major discovery or it was just like part of the data. It's like, Oh yeah, by the way, or did somebody come up with that going? And everyone was like, Oh my. Wow. I mean, I, I wouldn't call it like a, a eureka moment, but it okay. certainly was one of those things where it was on the table of, of, of the potential possibilities. Right. Okay. But when it became so clear that that was definitively the reason, right. When we ruled out species specific, issues and we ruled out these other things that were not responsible for contributing to those th that discrepancy and it came down to age and the onset of disease as the two factors that were contributing it just made it just made it so crystal clear right like we now had a problem that was very identifiable concrete clear and then now we could go about trying to solve that so i think that was how I would describe that moment, right? It, it, it really directed at us at saying, okay, this is the issue. It's not mm. a host of issues that, you know, we need to worry about in this facet. The cells are not performing because of this one thing, right? Age and disease. And so for us, you know, that's what motivated me in my career to say, okay, the last thing that we want to do as physicians and scientists is develop an amazing strategy to help intercept disease and provide value to a patient and then have to tell patients that are in desperate need of that solution that they're not a candidate because unfortunately they're either too old or already too sick. So that's the future that we saw evolving if we didn't do something to intercept that aging process and have an opportunity to have cells that would be of higher quality that we could deliver results on, right? And so this is a very prospective thing, right? You need to be thinking ahead. And so unfortunately, sometimes as, as golfers and individuals, that wisdom comes later in years, right? In my 20s, I wasn't sitting around thinking about my, my poor body that was failing me, right? I felt pretty good getting out of bed in the morning. Um, as I've you know gone through life, you, you see those differences. And so the important part and the sense of urgency now is to say, okay, we now have opportunities where we as individuals can take action to give ourselves the opportunity to take advantage of regenerative medicine therapies in the future with a much higher quality of starting material. Wow. Your Canadian came through and you said aging process, pro, process, pro, process. 
Well, just ask me to say house or mouse house or any of those things. <laughs> in a I'll boot. give it a, yeah, a boot. <laughs> a boot. All right, we're going to take another time out. We'll be right back. As somebody who, actually, on my next birthday this summer, I will definitely be in the late 60s category, so I'll be hitting 67, um, I have a lot of friends who have had knee replacements, need re- knee replacements. Um, one friend who had one knee replacement uh, needs a second one, but now he's got hip pain that is just mm-hmm. debilitating. Mm-hmm. Um is there any correlation with the fact that, and, I, and I'm doing really well for my age, um, but I didn't play competitive sports as a kid. And a lot of people that I know who've had these issues really pounded their body as a young person. Mm-hmm. Is there any correlation there? I think absolutely, right? And I think there's certain sports that are harder on our bodies than others. Yeah. Right? So obviously football being in, and rugby being obvious ones. Yeah. Um, the impact injuries tend to, to be more acute, right? And they can end up causing problems later in life. But repeat injuries kind of catch up to you. And all of a sudden, one day, you feel it. Um, we, we do punish our bodies in certain activities. Like I was a pitcher, right? A very unnatural motion of, of throwing a, a ball overhand. And mm-hmm. I ended up um, having my supraspinatus and labrum fail me. Had a, had a tear in them, and that's what ended up leading to the uh, the slowdown and and into the denouement of my career. But um, that being said, I still feel it to this day, right? I've rehabbed back. You know, I even played for a while longer after that injury. But ultimately, um, if I sleep on that shoulder in the wrong way, I'll wake up in the morning sore as heck. Mm. So for for me, I think you know, it is something that I envision myself dealing with for the rest of my life, right? And so, you know, labral injury and a rotator cuff injury is very common. In fact, 65% of people over 65 have a rotator cuff injury, whether they acknowledge it or not, right? If, if we were to, to examine it, we would find a tear. So if, if we think about just the sheer statistics, this is something that the majority of people are going to deal with their life after 65, alone. So whether that's caused by sports, repeat injuries, wear and tear, single acute injury, right? It's something that a lot of us are going to have to deal with. And I think that these opportunities to enhance the ability for us to regenerate our own tissues, especially ones that are poorly served by our circulatory system, right? And don't have good blood flow like tendons and ligaments and cartilage. Um, We really have an opportunity to fast track and actually excite that response of our bodies to perform healing. And that is, is one of the endeavors that we are working on with the cells that we collect from individuals. Um, there's a number of aesthetic treatments, which, you know, we do care about and are, are very near term, but sports medicine is obviously very close to my heart. Um, and I'm hoping, and I have my cells banked and tucked away that as I age, and if this does get worse, I'll have an opportunity to use those cells and leverage my own stem cells to incite that injury. Um, and it's already here. Like we are seeing athletes right now, um, tapping into some of these next generation technologies. Um, you know, Brooks Kepka was, was somebody that has, has announced and, and announced that he has received, um, stem cell therapy on his knee. Um, and so there's a number of individuals that are competing at that high level that are getting access to this. We see a number of uh, people in Hollywood, red carpet celebrities, leveraging their own stem cells in aesthetic medicine and otherwise. And so, um, you know, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. I, I have to say that not every stem cell therapy I would condone. <laughs> um, you know, I, I very firmly agree with following Health Canada and FDA regulations for approval for approvals for these therapies, and there certainly are groups out there that I think are are offering some treatments that I I wouldn't advise people to pursue. Um, that being said, um, there's certainly um, many many groups, including ourselves, that are doing this in a way that is putting patient safety first, and uh, and and looking at trying to deliver benefit regenerative medicine benefit to patients as soon as possible. So what is the optimal age to uh, get your cells banked? Yeah, so it's a good question. And um, I'm going to try to answer this very uh, sensitively since you said you're getting into your upper 60s. <laughs> I won't take it personally because <laughs> I'm way past so, that age. 
I'm yeah. thinking my children. <laughs> yeah, we track we track a lot of changes in our bodies as we age, and and uh, some of the significant ones um, include genetic mutations, um, you know, free radical damage, and and things that accumulate. But one of the big ones is the amount of adult stem cells that we have in our bodies. That peaks in our twenties as we mm -hmm. mature, and then unfortunately, it's a, a slow arithmetic decline throughout our lives goes down every year that goes by and it starts in your 20s going down so very quick unfortunately that arithmetic line starts to pick up pace around 65 hmm. and so after 65 years of age we see a a leap forward in the pace of some of these losses including the amount of adult stem cells that we have in our bodies right we, we kind of use up our supplies they are not able to uh to maintain their cell populations because we are over tapping into them i would say and we get to a point where unfortunately we just don't have the adult stem cell stock in our bodies to maintain that function um if, of every various tissue um and so that is that is the the moments of urgency i think you know your average 20 year old is not thinking about old age um, but certainly as you're approaching 65 it, it is definitely on your mind you know that you're probably not the same person that you were in your 20s performance wise and so um, we have a few sense of urgencies in our lives but we we definitely see a, a large influx of people um, that are tapping into our technology as they approach 65. Oh, I'm so depressed. Um, that being said, though, we, we, we have, you know, <laughs> one of our clients um, banked their cells at 83, right? Really? So, I mean, yeah, well, his, his mindset is um, it's not just about, about my age currently, but it's about locking in that age, right? And so his oh. plan is to live to 100 um, and ultimately hopefully stay active that length of time. Um, and so his cells at 83 are going to be much better than they are at 93, Right. One of the things that we track that I said is genetic mutations and the amount of genetic mutations that our bodies have doubles every decade. Right. So at least he'll have half the genetic mutations inside his cells at 83 than he will at 93. So what if you share DNA with someone as mm -hmm. if my son's do uh, they freeze them and I use yeah. them? Is that possible? Does that help? Is that... So it, <laughs> it's not impossible, but it's not probable. Oh, yeah. Damn. So um, your <laughs> children are not 100% you. Right. Um, and so unfortunately, those minute differences even um, can lead to rejection of those cells. And even when we have cells that are given to any other individual, right, as a donor, the recipient will be put on immunosuppressants to make sure that we don't reject those cells, no matter how close of a match it is. Um, and unfortunately, immunosuppressants come with a whole host of issues. Um, and so we usually don't use them unless that therapy is literally going to save that person's life because it comes with so many complications and risks on top. And so when we're thinking about performance issues or aesthetic issues, um, it's not probable that the risk that you would take on by going on immunosuppressants to take donor cells would be acceptable. Um, you know, for something that is not necessarily going to save your life. So having your own cells is absolutely the answer. Like no mm -hmm. one's cells are identical to yours. Your genetic code is, is, is unique. And ultimately, um, you want to have your own cells to use for future therapies. And it really is worth considering no matter how old you are. Yes, absolutely. There's some, some good times to do it, right? Sometimes that are better than others. The, the, the best advice I can give is um, react quickly, right? Um, this is the youngest you're ever going to be. And so locking in that time point. So the earlier, the better. Um, but we do see some moments in our lives where there is a heightened sense of urgency, like in our 60s and uh, potentially in our 20s, if we really want to get ahead of this and have our best cells locked down. Oh, that's fascinating. Let's take one more time out. We'll be right back. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans, we talked to Chuck Evans of Medicus Golf Institute with insights and drills on those things in golf that are sometimes counterintuitive. I was having this discussion with a couple of teachers the other day, and they asked me, what percentage of golfers did I think started with the club face square? And I said, probably 90, 95 percent. Well, 90 to 95 percent of all the amateur golfers in the world 
slice it because they set up with the club face square. And they should be setting up with it slightly open, which is counterintuitive. But that's how it works. With the technology we have today, track man, flight scope, and all that, we'll show you that the ball, except with the driver, is going to leave at 85 to 90 percent in the direction that the club face is pointed when the ball leaves the face. Primarily, your ball will start at a right angle to the leading edge of the club face. So if I want to hit a ball that starts to the right of target and then draws back, I need to align that way but set my club face square to me, not to the target line. Because if I set it square to the target line, I'm either going to hit a fade or I'll hit the biggest pull hook you've ever seen. That's Golf Smarter Mulligans, episode 164, featuring Chuck Evans of Medicus Golf Institute. Please, along with your subscription to Golf Smarter, subscribe to Golf Smarter Mulligans, the best of the Golf Smarter archives that are just no longer available on any podcast app. It's published every Friday from wherever you listen to your podcasts. Okay, there was just some talk from the side of the room there. What was that about me? What? <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to get you scheduled in quickly. <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm, I'm starting to hit the limit here. Hmm. <laughs> All right, let's make this relevant for golfers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, ultimately, I think that what, what golfers are going to mostly experience is a slowing down of their ability to keep doing what they love as they get older. Um, and so what we want to see is golfers and other athletes have the ability, whether it's recreational or, or professional, have the ability to keep doing what they want to do uh, as long as they possibly can and extend the longevity of, of their passion. And so by having your, your younger cells available to you, you'll be able to tap into a better resource to get some of the, the treatments and therapies we need to continue to stay active as our bodies, unfortunately, start to slow down. And is it a uh, one-time thing? Is it a treatment? It's a process. You've used those yeah, words. What I'm glad does you entail? asked. It's, it's very easy. Um, so this is part of the beauty of it. And I think um, what I've been really excited about um, our approach. Technology has advanced. I've been so privileged to, to be, do what I do during this time because the leaps and bounds that technology has advanced is just um, mind boggling. And we are able right now to take and harvest adult stem cells from something as simple as your hair follicles. So literally by just plucking follicles from the back of the scalp, right? Basically in the back of your head, ear to ear, we're able to access cells that can be then cryogenically frozen and preserved for you long-term. The hair follicle is this amazing organelle, and my life, wife loves that that word organelle. But it's essentially this miniature, right, organ. Um, it's complex. It has multiple cell types. We have keratinocytes, fibroblasts, mesenchymal stem cells. These adult stem cells that really act as a repository for us. When we cut our skin, it's actually cells from the hair follicle that migrate into our skin, those adult stem cells, to heal that wound. So it's this like wellspring of these cells and it's packaged in this nice tight little follicle, right? This bulb that we can actually access non-invasively. So there's no drilling into your iliac crest to harvest bone marrow, right? Or even a blood draw, right? This is the ability to harvest cells for you and, and freeze them in time non-invasively, simply and painlessly. Whoa. What about, yeah. you know, I mean, that hair is not my issue. Um, but there's a lot of people who have no follicles or yeah. do they still have follicles even though they're, they're completely bald? Or they, they do. Yeah. So, so you don't lose your follicles, you, your follicles lose the ability to create hair. That being said, most people are not completely bald. Right. Right. But so if they, uh, if they uh, uh, don't recreate hair, are they still v vital enough and valuable enough to be regenerated? Well, we take the ones that are producing hair, the last place that you go bald, um, you know, at least in androgenic alopecia, right, that, that you know, does affect a lot of men, um, is the back of your head, right, basically from ear to ear. That's the last okay. place that you would to lose them. And so the vast majority of people, unless you have an actual genetic disease that turns off, essentially, your, your follicles from producing hair systemically across your whole body, 
you will have follicles that do produce hair at the back of your scalp. And so as long as we can grab the hair, um, then we can harvest a follicle. And also by harvesting a follicle in this way, by plucking, that follicle will continue to grow back. So you're not losing that hair permanently, just, just uh, temporarily. Wow. Um, and, and so what is the process called? What the, you guys are working on? Yeah, so promoting. the company is called Acorn. We do adult stem cell harvesting um, through okay. plucking follicles. Okay. Um, so it is it is a stem cell banking service that allows you to lock in your current age and current health long term by having a sample collected today simply by having your follicles plucked. Um, you know, if uh, if if viewers want to learn a little bit more about what what they uh, what we do, they can visit Acorn.me. Um, we have partnered with a number of, of some of the top people in, uh, in Toronto, some of the top physicians to offer this to their patients. And we are very quickly coming to the U S. So we're very excited to, uh, very excited to come back and, and start to offer this to, to U S citizens. Although we have many that have, have come up to visit us in Toronto, uh, we'll be launching the service in the U S very shortly. And so you can actually sign up to a wait list to have first access as soon as we launch in the U S and, um, and um, yeah, you can do that all through the website. Is this an FDA issue? No, no, it's not an FDA issue at all. So the the harvesting of of your cells and banking them long term is not a diagnostic or a treatment in itself, right? So this is a preparation for the treatment. So there's no FDA issue or Health Canada issue. Obviously, the vast majority of treatments of these cells will require FDA and Health Canada approvals. That being said. One of the first areas that we are actively working on with physicians and with groups is to create products from these cells, not give the cells back to individuals. And so um, I'm sure a lot of your viewers have heard of what I kind of call intro regenerative medicine, which is PRP, platelet rich plasma. You can draw blood spin it down in a centrifuge and access the plasma and all of the growth factors and things that can help deliver benefit and inject that back into a site of injury. Very common treatment right now in sports medicine and aesthetics, even dentistry. Um, instead of actually having, you know, that, that concentrate of growth factors that come from your blood, we can actually, from your younger cells, create the growth factors that are specific to certain areas of your body, like muscle, tendon, ligament, skin. And so you can end up getting a more specialized product that is from your own cells, manufactured by your own cells to deliver that benefit for you. And so we can tune these cells to create things like collagen that is so essential in um, healing of tendons and ligaments. And so if we can really conceive about creating your own collagen and putting that into the site of injury to allow for the building blocks that are required for proper repair, um, it can be a, a world of difference in the future for somebody that is looking to, uh, to bounce back from an injury and keep playing. Um, and so that is what you are locking in the ability to create these things from your better self, your better cells. This is not something that you can like pluck one of your own hair, stick it in an envelope and mail it to you guys. Is this a, a done no, in a doctor's office? You're going to need a special kit for done? that. <laughs> we'll send it to you. So, um, yeah, so our, our, um, our, what we have done as a as a group of, of scientists is really engineer and uh, and patent the media that makes sure that those cells stay alive and viable uh, after collection before cryopreservation. And so every time a cell leaves the body, it, it does want to expire, right? So we got to make sure that it is in a healthy, happy environment. And so we've engineered a solution for that so that we can get cells from your clinician or from you back to our central uh, repository or laboratory where they're processed in a clean room environment. Um, they're counted. We send a report back to everybody confirming that it was done successfully and, and count the number of cells, the number of follicles, all of those metrics to make sure that we have an adequate amount. And, uh, and then they're actually cryogenically frozen. So I don't know if uh, anybody remembers Terminator 2 when uh, the T-3000 or whatever he was ended up getting covered from that liquid that was coming out of that truck and frozen solid instantly. Um, that it was liquid nitrogen. And so it sits at negative 190 degrees Celsius. And at those temperatures, it is literally frozen in time. There's no cell metabolism. The cells do not age. They are the same state as when you froze them. 
Isn't that what happened to Harrison Ford in one of the Star Wars movies too? Yeah, so I believe that was a carbonite chamber. I'm a bit okay. of a nerd. Um, <laughs> so very different technology that doesn't exist yet, but uh, oh, very si course. similar principle. Of course, they made it up. So, <laughs> so again, this needs to be done in a very specific, it can't just, any doctor's office can, can't do this. No, this has no to it's, be done it's a very, very specialized specific laboratory spot. that does this. Um, um, but okay. it is a technology, right, as, as a concept that has existed since the 60s, right? Mm -hmm. So this is something that we've improved over time in our ability to freeze cells. And it really is popular in, in areas like fertility. And we do it routinely mm -hmm. in, in freezing eggs and sperm and making sure that those are tucked away in the same way that, you know, women are, are banking their eggs as they're careering and, and making sure that they want to maintain their ability to have children and a family later um you know it's the same principle really it's about tucking a piece of you away so that you can leverage that later to keep doing the things that you want to do um and and the technology is extremely um sophisticated and advanced right so you end up needing very specialized media that inhibit the ice crystal formation inside cells and so this is not something that you're going to accomplish at a uh a standard doctor's office or a clinic, yeah. uh, you need a specialized laboratory to do this. Um, and we've built that and we're really excited that, uh, you know, we're able to provide access to, to patients and clients today. Where do you see this science in five years and in 10 years? That's a good question. Um, so it is, it is obviously very difficult to predict the future, mostly because it's happening so fast. <laughs> right. Um, we have four active research projects that are going on uh, with some of the top institutions in Canada and have already engaged with some in the U.S. as we're entering that market. Um, but we work at the University of Toronto, McGill University, National Research Council, Mount Sinai Hospital. And some of these endeavors that we're doing in these grant funded research projects is take a human hair follicle and push those cells down different lineages, different types of cells. So not just thinking about some of the cells that reside naturally in that area, like skin and, and mesenchymal cells to treat sports injuries, but thinking about dialing them to pancreas, neurons, kidney cells, so that we can actually start to use them to tackle disease. Um, and so recently this past mo month, we just got a wave of, of data from that ongoing study, and we were able to recreate pancreas cells on demand from a patient's hair follicle. So thinking about things that are, um, you know, some of the biggest diseases that, that plague us, like diabetes, um, you know, I see in 10 years us using these cells to start tackling diseases, not just performance and aesthetics. All right, well, golfers around the world, here's your chance to stop complaining about you're getting too old to play a game. Yeah, you can at least say part of me isn't. <laughs> exactly, part of me isn't. Drew, this has been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate your time coming on and sharing this with us. No, I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Fred. Fan of the show. Really excited to be on it. Well, there's proof once again that you just never know what you're going to hear on this podcast because it did relate to golf. I mean, there is there is golf content in there that, you know, it's not going to change your score, but it could change your life. Anyway, thanks to Ron Schumann of Roxbury, New Jersey, uh, for doing the show opening today. You know, it's one thing to listen to Golf Smarter, and hopefully you do so regularly, but it's another thing altogether to become a Golf Smarter ambassador. It's really easy to do. One, you report back to your golf buddies about what you heard, what you learned, and what made you laugh on this show. And two, do an episode opening and select from one of our prizes. Hey, you can get a sleeve of Golf Smarter Balls, the Tony Manzoni video, or receive a glove and glove storage compartment from redroostergolf.com, where you can choose from 11 different styles of gloves in 26 sizes so that they fit you properly. We thank redroostergolf.com for offering a new glove to our Golf Smarter Ambassadors. So please join the team and win a prize just for leaving a voicemail. Write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com and let me know that you'd like to do an episode intro and I'll send you some really simple instructions. Oh, I have so much to share with you today and let's start with this past weekend's U.S. Open winner, Matt Fitzpatrick. You may have noticed that the most prominent sponsor on his shirt was Protivity. And you probably didn't even know how to say it. You just saw the words, but it's Protivity. Now, most people have no idea what Protivity is, but actually I do 
because I've been producing their podcasts and even some of their promotional videos for more than a decade. Protivity is an international consulting firm that focuses on risk management, IT security, and compliance with boardrooms and C-suite executives around the world. This is their second year of sponsoring golfers, and boy, did it pay off this week. <laughs> I heard from my client this morning, who's also become a regular golf buddy. He, he reported to me that on Monday, yesterday, the day after Fitzpatrick's clutch victory over Will Zalatoris, that their website received five times the amount of usual traffic, and that also included a tremendous amount of positive feedback from their clients. Now, here's the crazy part. They also sponsor Jennifer Cupcho, who won an exciting three-way playoff this Sunday at the Meyer LPGA Classic. So, yeah, I guess it pays to sponsor tour golfers as long as they win. Okay, now for my excitement. I, and I'm so glad that I can share this with you. Last week, I had what I can easily say was the greatest round of my life so far. It was one of those days that everything seemed to work and very little went wrong. Some went wrong, but very little went wrong. But I have to share these details, frankly, because my wife and friends are tired of hearing about it, but I wanted to share it with you. So I played my favorite regular course, Rooster Run Golf Course in Petaluma, California. It's in Sonoma County, about an hour north of San Francisco. So let me go over this as quickly as possible, sharing some of the shots that only happen on TV. As my regular playing partners were out of town, I played with a friend who I've only played with once before, and that was before COVID. So there was no pressure to perform or get too invested in the score or even think about gambling with him. Good. And, but I got a little bit invested late in the round, and you'll understand why. So let's go from the start. Bogey number one, par four. I had pars on number two and three. Then on number four, my approach shot from the fairway landed on the fringe at the back of the green, leaving me a downhill left to right breaking 22 footer, which dropped for birdie. Then I parred number five. Number six is a 135 yard par three, which landed left of the flag about eight feet away. And it fell in for another birdie. Par on number seven. Bogey on the long and tough par three number eight. And then my nemesis number nine, par five, with water on the right off the drive and water on the left of the second shot, bringing me to hit the green in regulation. But I was about more than 60 feet away on the green with an uphill, then dropping back downhill and unfortunately, I had my only three putt of the day, ending on the front nine with a one over 37. Now, as I waited to tee off on the par five number 10, I was thinking about what Dr. Parent said a few weeks ago and ran my finger of my right hand up and over each finger of my left hand to slow down my breath and try to stay focused which led to pars on 10, 11, 12, 13, and then a greenside sand save on 14, followed by what is a nasty dog leg left, which left me with a chip up to the green, but I still had a 14-foot putt, and I made it for par. Now, going into number 15, which is a short 110-yard island green at one over, I made the mistake of thinking of my scorecard and chunked the ball into the water and walked away with a painful double bogey. Hey, that's golf. Let it go. Now, I'm three over with three to go. And here's where it got crazy. My drive on 16 was smacked right up the middle, leaving me and going, uh, and the wind was cutting left to right. This place is next to an airport, so it's kind of windy there. Anyway, this left me 125 yards to a front pin location. My ball landed and stopped at the front edge of the green, and that left me with a 16-foot uphill putt, which dropped in for birdie. 
My drive on 17 with a three wood went left and landed near the fence behind some trees. So I had to punch it out to put myself in position. The ball ended up in a downhill rough around 110 yards from a middle left pin location. Now, the other two seniors we were paired with were absolutely entertaining and really working each other hard. Mick, a firefighter in San Francisco, originally from New Jersey, hit his approach shot on 17, stopping at about seven feet from the flag at about three o'clock. His partner, Tom, from Dublin, Ireland, who was dropping F-bombs all day long and kept us in stitches. The two of them were just playing for beers, but they had something on the line, and it was an intense competition because they clearly know each other and play together a lot. Tom's shot landed on the front of the green, rolled uphill, and stopped literally up against Mick's ball. They're sitting together, like seven feet from the pin, just sitting side by side. Now, my third shot which again, I'm on a downhill lie in the rough, landed on the left fringe a bit above the hole and then rolled back down towards the flag, but then past the flag, and I'm not kidding, it hit both Tom and Mick's balls, pushing Tom's two... I mean, we were laughing about the fact that their two balls went close together, and now mine knocked into them, pushing Tom's about two feet away, And then my ball kept rolling and passed and settled about 10 feet from the pin. Once we replaced Tom's ball, and then we had to move their markers to open a clean line for my putt, which I dropped in for par. Tom made his, and Mick, no, he missed. Making them tied going into the par 5 18th. This is a hole that I have reached in two before. But mostly the approach shot through like a goalpost opening of trees forces you to position the third shot to a back left flag as opposed to going for it, which doesn't really work. Now, my final shot was right where I was hoping to leave it at about 110 yards out. I nailed it, but I left myself a 25 foot downhill left to right putt that unbelievably fell in for my fourth birdie of the day to our amazement and cheers. So with two birdies on 16 and 18, following my double on 15, my final score was 37 on the front, 36 on the back for a one over 73. Now, if you follow me on the app called 18 birdies, which I use whenever I'm playing, you can see my scorecard that includes 10 pars, 10 fairways, 10 greens in regulation, and only 27 putts. Now, I know that this is golf, and it could happen at any time for all of us. So I'm not expecting miracle rounds like this again, but I know I'm capable of doing it, and I thank you for letting me share it with you. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions for upcoming episodes, or want to report on your game, please click on the Hey Fred button at GolfSmarter.com.